Psalm 119 is found beginning on page 487. And I want us to consider a few verses, however, from the latter part of the psalm on page 489. We will begin with verse 19 of Psalm 118 on page 489 in the prayer book. First of all, Psalm 118 you're going to find is a very important psalm. It is quoted in the New Testament more than any other psalm. Highly important. Also, it is a favorite of many people, and one of those people was Martin Luther. 118 was Martin Luther's favorite psalm. This is what he wrote about it, typical for Luther, what he says. This is my psalm, <laughs> my chosen psalm. I love them all. I love all Holy Scripture, which is my consolation and my life. But this psalm is nearest my heart. And I have a peculiar right to call it mine. It has saved me from many a pressing danger from which nor emperor, nor kings, nor sages, nor saints could have saved me. It is my friend, dearer to me than all the honors and powers of the earth. What a wonderful testimony to the power of this psalm in Martin Luther's life. The original setting for this psalm, however, is liturgical. It is a processional psalm, and it teaches us, in the words of it, <clears throat> as they are repeated, describes, if you will, a group of pilgrims coming to the Jewish temple and coming in to give thanks unto the Lord. And we see the liturgical nature of this at, at verse 19 especially. Let's read this. I'll read verse 19. You read verse 20. Open me the gates of righteousness, that I may go into them and give thanks unto the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter into it. The pilgrims have come to the gates of the temple, and they ask the Levites to open the gates that they may come in to worship the Lord. And the Levites inside warn them, this is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter into it. And then the answer is, I will thank thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. This psalm, or a form of it, was used for the first time when the altar and foundations of the second Jewish temple were laid. Now remember, in the Old Testament there are two temples. The first one was built under the leadership of King Solomon. It was destroyed by the Babylonians in 590 B.C. Seventy years later, the exiles return from Babylon, and they are given permission to build a second temple, smaller than the first, but still, they were allowed to build a second temple, and they began that construction at 520 B.C. The book of Ezra chapter 3 describes the foundations and the altar of this second temple. It is this second temple, in fact, that many centuries later Herod enlarged. And that second temple that Herod enlarged was the one standing when our Lord walked the earth. And that second temple in turn was destroyed by the Roman legions in A.D. 70. So in Ezra chapter 3, verse 11, we are told that after the altar and foundations of the second temple were established, the people came to the temple singing and giving thanks unto the Lord, quote, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever for Israel, just as we read this morning in the psalm. And it says that they sang it by course. In other words, it was a responsorial psalm, just like we did this morning. In fact, this psalm is still used in the consecration of a church. The bishop will stand outside the door and take his crozier and knock on the outside of the door saying, Open me the gates of righteousness that I may go into them and give thanks unto the Lord. From a Christian perspective, when we give thanks unto the Lord, we are asking to make Eucharist to the Lord, the great thanksgiving. So the bishop says, Open me these gates. And inside, the most senior layperson, the senior warden, will say, This is the gate of the Lord. 
and the righteous shall enter into it. So this psalm is still very important, even in our own liturgy today. If we go on and look at verse 22 and 23, we also find something very important. It says, the same stone, which the builders refused, is become the headstone in the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, when you think of a headstone, you may think of a cemetery. But literally, it's not a headstone, it is a top stone. And uh, again, it's also described as a cornerstone. If you look at the phrase there, literally, it is the top stone in the angle. So if you look at the literal translation, it's more like a keystone. You know what a keystone is in an arch. The keystone at the top is the thing that keeps the arch from falling. And yet, in some certain sense, this stone is not only on top, but it's also on the bottom, because it's like a cornerstone. We use cornerstones to make sure that a building is square, don't we? That has to be laid first for the foundation to be stable. So how can a top stone also be a cornerstone simultaneously? Well, they say it's the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. In order to understand what this means in terms of the Old Testament, and also what it means in terms of our Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, we have to understand, again, this psalm was said perhaps for the first time at the opening of that second temple. The words are recorded for us. And Ezra is very careful to record that the altar was set up first, and then the foundations. What happened was that the Jews cleared out the rubble from the destruction of the first temple, and they found the altar stone, and it was elevated above the others. It was the stone in which the Ark of the Covenant stood in the first temple. It is the stone upon which the high priest stood in the second temple on the Day of Atonement, to offer uh, blood for the forgiveness of Israel's sins the year before. That stone was three fingers breadth higher than the others. It was literally the top stone. And yet they used it to build the dimensions of the second temple, so it was also the foundation. In fact, they named that stone the Foundation Stone because from it they believed that the mercy of God proceeded when the high priest entered into there on the Day of Atonement to confess sins. There it was that God's justice and mercy was to be found. So the elevated stone, the top stone, was also the foundation stone simultaneously. Like a cornerstone, from that one elevated stone all the dimensions of the temple were built. And in the context of the Old Testament, the builders refused that stone. What does that mean? At the time, it is felt that the builders who refused that stone were the ones who laid it to begin with. The builders of the first temple scorned God's commandments and ordinances, and they were deported into uh, Babylon because they participated in idolatry. They refused the commandment of the Lord. And yet, providentially being brought back to Jerusalem, the Lord showed them and supplied them the top stone, which was also the foundation stone, the basis of reestablishing worship in Jerusalem again. It's really a wonderful idea that they had that the Lord did this for us, and the Lord is blessing our work here. But we know, of course, from the New Testament that Jesus supplied that symbol of the stone, that type of the stone, to himself. And it's really amazing how often you can find it in the New Testament. For example, Psalm 118 was sung as a Jesus marched in triumph into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. We know this because St. Matthew writes in chapter 21, verse 9, the multitudes went before him 
And the multitudes that followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Quoting Psalm 118, Hosanna simply means God save us. It's a transliteration of a Hebrew phrase. They sang Psalm 118 as Jesus entered in triumph into Jerusalem. And uh, the chief priests of the temple understood very well what was going on. By saying Hosanna in the highest, they were calling Jesus God. And what did they do? They said, you should rebuke your disciples. And what did Jesus respond? Do you remember? He said, if these do not sing, the stones will. The stones will sing if these people do not. Later on, as he is confronted again by the chief priests in the temple, still plotting against Jesus, he tells them the parable of the wicked husband. And at the end of the parable, it's, it's apparent who Jesus is talking about. And he ends the parable by saying, When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do to the husbandman that beat his servants in and killed the son? They say unto him, unto Jesus, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And in verse 45 of Matthew 21, it states, and when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. He is the stone which they are now refusing. St. Peter understood this. He healed a lame man in the temple. It's recorded in Acts chapter 4. He's hauled before the great Sanhedrin, comes before the high priest of Israel. And they say, how can you dare heal this lame man in the temple, claiming it in the power of Jesus? And Peter responds, be it known unto you all, you leaders of Israel, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man who was healed stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. And neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The stone is a symbol of the salvation of God. It is Jesus himself. Paul understood this very well uh, himself. He says that the stone is a sign of salvation offered to all, just as our Old Testament reading from Zechariah told us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, St. Paul said, Through him, through Jesus, we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So the new temple is being built, not of stones, but of people. And the heart of that temple is no longer a stone, but it is our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in him where the justice and mercy of God is found. It is the center and heart of our worship. St. Peter mentions Psalm 118 again in his first letter, where he says that the stone of stumbling has now become glorified. And ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's a new temple being built. It's being built by every person who has faith in Christ. 
we together become a habitation of the Holy Spirit. And he is the center of that temple. He is the keystone at the top. He is the gate of righteousness, the gate of heaven. By the keystone, the building stands. But he is also the foundation stone, supporting us from the bottom, making sure that his building stands sure. Jesus is the living stone given by God for building a new temple for which, in which his spirit will dwell. He is both the top and the foundation. Scripture tells us that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and Omega of our salvation. The righteous enter into the temple. And we enter into his temple with the righteousness of Christ, not our own. He has become the rock of our salvation, and it is the Lord's doing. It is not ours. It is his sacrifice. It is the blood of the new covenant <laughs> sprinkled on that foundation stone that allows us into the new heavenly temple, where we can proclaim that I was once not your child, but by the new covenant supplied in your son, thou art my God and I will thank thee. Thou art my God and I will praise thee, just as Psalm 118 says. But there's one more thing you need to know about this psalm. It is a psalm of victory. It is a psalm of salvation. It is a psalm of thanksgiving, but it is also a psalm of consolation. Psalm 118 is the last of a series of psalms recited by the Jews during Passover. And we know from the New Testament that after the institution of the Eucharist, after our Lord left the upper room, he sang Psalm 118 with his apostles as he walked to the Garden of Gethsemane to give to the world the salvation this psalm proclaims. It was his psalm. It speaks of him. It tells us of the salvation God has given us if we come to him by faith. This psalm has always been a source of consolation to God's people. Many of the reformers sang this song as they were being led to be burned at the stake. This psalm can be yours too in times when you are oppressed of people in times of your trial, in times of tribulation, in times when you want to give up, use Psalm 118 to remind yourself of what God has done for you in Christ. It was surely one of his favorites, and it was the last thing he sang before the agony of the garden and the events of the Passion. It's been many people's favorite psalm. As I mentioned, it was Martin Luther's as well. It is said of him that he put verse 17, which says, I will not die, but live and tell of the works of the Lord upon a plaque in his study wall where he could see it every day. He knew that many in the Reformation had been killed, but Luther used that one verse to cheer himself. It assured him that he was perfectly safe until his work on earth was done, where he could tell of the works of the Lord. And so can you. And so in the words of the psalm, give thanks unto the Lord. For his, he is gracious and his mercy extended to us in Christ. The top stone and the bottom stone, the gate of heaven and the foundation of our salvation, it endures forever. Amen. <laughs>